All right, um, let's dive into the Word of God together. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. Father, thank you again that you have brought us to the table of your word to feast. Lord, let us leave here full of your word and full of you. And dear God, I pray that you would just prepare the hearts for the seed of the word of God to be planted into it. That we will leave here not just being hearers of your word, but Lord, determined to be doers. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth chapter 3, looking at verses 1 through 13, and the title of this message is God, Our Provider, Part 1. God, Our Provider, Part 1. Now, one of the names for God is Jehovah Jireh, which means God, Our Provider. Abraham gives God this name on top of Mount Moriah. Uh, in Genesis uh, 22, in verse 14, when God provided a ram for him to sacrifice instead of his son Isaac. So he gave God that name, God is provider. And in, the, in this chapter, we will see how God provided for these two widows, Naomi and Ruth. This shows us that God cares about us and loves us, and God wants to be a provider for us. This is one thing we have to see, that God delights to be a provider for us. All these great names that God is given uh, in the Old Testament and throughout Scripture, he wants to be that for us. He wants to provide. Jehovah Rapha, he wants to heal. Jehovah Nisi, he wants to be that banner that, that, uh, who wins the battles for us. Jehovah Shalom, he wants to be our peace. God wants to be these things to us, and we're going to see that he is going to provide for these two widows, Naomi and Ruth. Look at verses 1 through 5. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now, Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing uh, bar barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself and put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. <laughs> A little obedient. She was pretty obedient. I like that. Now, we, we, we left off in verse 2 or in chapter 2, should I say. With Ruth coming home and telling Naomi how a man named Boaz uh, has shown her favor and has been giving her loads of barley to take home, seeing that it was the barley harvest. Now, Boaz instructed Ruth to stay near the young women and don't go to any other fields but his. And once Naomi heard this news, she began to give Ruth some sound wisdom in verse 1. She said, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Here it is, this older, mature woman giving wisdom to this younger woman. And, and I love this. Now, please don't miss this important point. They were not content with the provisions of Boaz. Now they are seeking Boaz the person. So many people want the provisions of God. Let me name it and claim it, they say. Just like the prodigal son in, in Luke 15, who said in Luke 15, verse 12, Father, give me the goods. And so many people, so many Christians want the goods from God. Naomi and Ruth were not just wanting the goods from Boaz. Now they wanted Boaz. What about you? Are you content with the goods? Are you content with the barley? 
Or do you want Boaz, the person uh, who is a picture of Jesus Christ? Well, this is something all of us need to search our hearts about because if all of, if all of our goods were gone, would we still be happy with Boaz? Would we still be happy with Jesus? Naomi is about to tell Ruth how to have security or rest so it will be well with her. We can only find security and rest in a person and not in things, dear people. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 28, he says, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. In verse 2, she reveals that Boaz is a close relative, and the Jews had a law in place, the Leverite law, of how relatives were to take care of widows. I want you to notice this. So the responsibility was on the family members to take care of the widows and not the church or the government. Unless the widows were uh, over 60 years old and didn't have family, according to 1 Timothy 5, in verses 1 through 16, then the church stepped in at that particular time. We got it all twisted, and we got it backwards. We, we, we just a mess the way we got things twisted up today. If someone is widowed and, and all that kind of stuff, a widower, but the context of 1 Timothy 5 is a widow. And, and we have it twisted. The first thing, if anybody's in trouble, go to church, go to church. And you got folks that work the church circuit. Go to church. Now, biblically, the Bible said their family, uh, their, their family members were to take care of them. Not the church. But if they were over 60 years old, now 60 years old today is, is the new 45. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know we, it's, it, biblical time, 60 years old, you were, you were up, you were up there. And if you didn't have family members, the church stepped in and, and helped take care of it. But the, if you got family members, it was not, it's not the church's job to take care of your people. These are your people. Take care of your family. This, and it's not the government's job. I heard, about, I heard somebody talk about on social media how one, one lady was boasting about how she had been um, in the welfare system for 27 years. That's a career. <laughs> you got three more years before retirement? Well, I mean, what's that? What is that? You know, so it, it, it's a shame the way things are today. Naomi tells Ruth that Boaz, he's at the threshing floor. See, it was here at the threshing floor that they would separate the kernel from the chaff by tossing it up in the air, and the chaff would blow away with the wind, and the wheat would fall to the floor. They had a, a large, like, um, uh, fork kind of, um, sh you know, like a giant pitchfork, and, and they would toss it up in the air, and the chaff would blow away, and what would fall would be the wheat. And they'd keep tossing it, keep tossing it, keep tossing it, until all the chaff blew away, and all you have is, is wheat. And that's what they did uh, there. And it would just blow away and leave nothing but the wheat on the floor. Now, like I said, they would repeat this process over and over and over and over until all the chaff is gone. It reminds me of what Psalm 1 verse 4 says. It said, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. So when we chase after the things of the world, you know we're chasing after the chaff. It's amazing. First John, um, First John 2 verses 15 through 17 it says, love not this world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Notice, the world is passing away. And we, even as God's people, are chasing after the world that's passing away. We're chasing after the chaff. That's what we're chasing after. Instead of chasing after God, 
running hard for him. We're running after chaff, which blows away with, with the rest of the world. It's amazing to me what we do as believers. Instead of chasing after God, we're chasing after chaff. It's amazing to me. Amazing what we do as people of God. Now, chaff is the husk uh, of the corn that needs to be separated from the grain that is synonymous with dross, uh, uh, rubbish, or garbage. It's synonymous with that. And we know from Acts 2 in verse 2 and John 3 verse 8 that the Holy Spirit is compared to the wind. So with this in mind, what chaff do you have in your life that you need to be blown away by the wind of the Spirit? Some chaff that you have allowed in your life or back into your life that the Spirit needs to blow away. Before we can be useful like wheat or barley, the chaff must be removed from our lives. And only you know what that is. You, only you know what rubbish, what dross, what garbage you have allowed in your life or back into your life that you need the wind of the Spirit to blow away. Now, in verses 3 through 7, these verses in the Hebrew, they're filled with all kinds of sexual overtones in the Hebrew language. Now, meaning what Naomi is asking Ruth to do was very risky and not necessarily the behavior of a of a widow. But remember, she wants Boaz the man and not just what he can give her. And we will see something, um, you know, some amazing parallels on how we can become more intimate with our Boaz, Jesus Christ, in a few moments. Now, in verse 3, Naomi first tells Ruth to wash herself. Notice, Na Naomi is actually taking her through the preparations uh, that was done for marriage. And as we prepare for our Boaz, Jesus Christ, we must wash ourselves in the water of the word, like Ephesians 5 and verse 26 teaches. We're cleansed by God's word, like Psalm uh, 119 and verse 9, and John 15 and verse 3 teaches. I just need to ask you, how much time do you really spend in God's word washing off the filth of this world? I say the filth of this world because James 1 in verse 27 says, keep yourselves unspotted from the world. In other wor words, the world seeks to get us dirty constantly with it's TV shows, it's movies, it's music, it's sexual images that they bombard us with constantly. So it is imperative that we wash ourselves like Ruth is told to do. How much time do you really spend in the Word of God? How much time do you spend just washing yourself in God's Word? Oh, you're doing it now as you you know, are here right now, but personally outside of here. Just think about it. Just, you get washed with the word here on Sundays and Wednesdays. That's like taking a bath two times a week. You stink. <laughs> oh, boy. You said, but I, I do it. I want to take a shower two times. We have to, we, we, can you, we get bombarded with the world's dirt all the time, constantly, every day. We need to be watched constantly in the Word of God. Now, not only did Naomi tell her to wash herself, but notice also anoint yourself. Anointing in the Bible is always associated with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus tells us in, in Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And when it comes to us, Luke 11, verse 13, 
that said Jesus said we can ask for the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We can ask. He says, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? It's yours for the asking. It's yours for, and you know, I used to think, I used to think that, you know, you just go and you just ask and, and God will give it to you. But lately, I would say within the last year or so, I now understand what the old folks used to talk about by tearing, ter tearing in the presence of God, when you tarry. The old folks used to talk about the, the, to tarry in the presence of God. It means to wait in God's presence. It's not just a casual, okay, God, you know, your, Bible, your word says, you know, I can ask for the Holy Spirit. Give me the Holy Spirit. Okay, see you, and we're out. No, there's something about soaking in his presence. The old folks used to talk about soaking in the presence of God. We're so instant. We're so right now. We're, we're so quick. I, I, you know, I, um, I had to apologize to the Lord the other day. I said, Lord, please forgive me for being in such a rush to leave your presence. You know, I, I have set times that I set aside to pray, and and when I, um, you know, when I know that that time is drawing near, you know, there's a little excitement that I can get to go run, do whatever it is I think it's time to do. And then I had to pause and just say, Lord, I'm sorry for being in such a rush to leave your presence. I have an audience with the creator of the universe. And I'm ready to ru rush off to go do some menial, earthly thing. I, am I in such a rush to leave social media? To leave working out? It, I, you know, I, I look at the, but we're in such a rush to leave God's presence. I just wondered about that. So this anointing Naomi is telling Ruth about was also a type of perfume, which reminds me of 2 Corinthians 2.15, which says, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Oh, you know I'm about to go there with this. What aroma do we have coming from us when people come around us or when we when we leave someone's presence you know how it is when someone has too much perfume on when they leave they walk past you and you're like whoa, whoa. you know it, 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 or some guy got too much cologne and burned his nostrils out so he can't smell it anymore so he just keeps squirting he just keeps squirting and then oh he got a whiff of it. he said i got enough he just don't know he leaving an aroma I just, I just, I just wonder, can, can, can people tell that we have been with Jesus at his feet? Be can they tell it? Do, do we have the aroma of Christ? We get this aroma by being with Jesus, by being at his feet in prayer, by by, by being with him. That's how we, you know, if we don't spend time with Jesus, you know what will happen? We will have the aroma of death, which is the very next verse, 2 Corinthians uh, 2.16 says. Just like the stench of something that is dead is how we will smell when people come around us or when we leave their presence. You know, there's nothing like the smell of good old microwave popcorn. And there's nothing like the smell when it's burnt. That just, I mean, it's like, whoa, you got to get that out the house. Then going to smell up the place. When we don't spend time with Jesus, that's what we're doing. We, we had sitting at the job, and we just smell like a bag of burnt popcorn. Just stink, stinking up the plate. That's what happens when we don't spend time with Jesus. Then Naomi told her 
to put on her best garment or take off the stinky clothes you wore while in the fields and put on your best garment. Oh, it reminds me of blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10 and verses uh, 46 to 52. When Jesus called him to come, Mark 10 and verse 50 says that Bartimaeus threw aside his garment and arose and came to Jesus. Oh, that garment he once wrapped himself in to beg from people. He threw it aside. Why? He knew once he came to Jesus, he wouldn't have to beg any longer. Tossed it aside, the garment. Are you trying to come to Jesus in dirty garments? Even when the prodigal son came home from fooling around and living with the pigs, the father put on him his very own garment. However, listen to what Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. God clothes us with his robe of of righteousness at salvation. But sometimes, sometimes we get them dirty with our sin, walking and living in this world. And we come to the word of God to wash like we're doing now here at church. But isn't it true the more you wash, the cleaner you are? Then we need to spend quality time washing in the word of God. The more you wash your, your little body, the cleaner you are. The same thing if we wash in the word of God, the cleaner we will be in our lives. So as Ruth gets herself fixed up with her, her perfume on, Naomi tells her, do not make yourself known to him until after he has finished eating and drinking. Then notice where he lies in verse 4, and go and uncover his feet. Now, the word feet is a euphemism for genitalia. And uncover is a reference to uncovering sexually. So the question is, how far up the leg is Naomi <laughs> suggesting that Ruth go. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just asking the question. How far up this leg are you talking about? I mean, now Naomi says at the end of verse four, after these things, Boaz will tell you what to do next. Ruth agrees in verse five to do what Naomi is telling her to do. Let's see. If, if, if Ruth is a little floozy, a loose woman, or whether she's a virtuous woman. We're going to see. We're going to see. Look what it says there in verse 6. It says, so she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. Okay. Ruth now goes down to the threshing floor to carry out the instructions of her mother-in-law. Then the reason why Boaz was sleeping uh, on the threshing floor is for, you know, it's for protecting the harvest from thieves. And I was thinking about this right before service. I said, man, you, you know, hey, your families need to know that you're a protector. This is what Boaz was doing. He was protecting, protecting the harvest. Do your families know that you're a protector at home? Hear a little noise, and you, you, you waking up your wife to go see what's going on. What's wrong with you? Get on down those stairs. What's wrong with you? So, no, you, you, they need to know that you are protected, that you're not some, some frady cat. And, some little, and you know, you hear a little noise, and you, you hiding under the bed. Get from under that bed. Go down and see what's going on. He was a protector. This man, Boaz, was a protector. 
Now, I want to bring something else to your attention. While in the fields, I want you to notice this, Ruth gleaned for herself. However, at the threshing floor, she is giving of herself. The question you must ask yourself is, are you still in the fields? Taking all you can get from Boaz? Or have you reached a place in your walk where you are ready for the threshing floor, the place of separation and sacrifice? Where are you in your walk with the Lord? Are you constantly trying to see what you can get from God? Has God become a spiritual or a cosmic Santa Claus from you? Someone to give you just a bunch of gifts? Has he become a cosmic genie and you rub your magical lamp of faith and out pops God and say, what are your three wishes? When, when does it come to a place where you don't come to God for the goods? You're not coming to see what you can get from him, that you're ready to offer yourself to him. When are you ready to get to that place? where you're ready to offer yourself in service to him, offer yourself to him for whatever it is he will want to do with you, to offer yourself to use your gifts and talents and abilities for the kingdom of God. When would it ever come to that place for you? Or are you still in the fields trying to get, get, get? But someday, one day, you have to come to a place where you are willing to now say, I'm ready to offer myself to you, Lord, for your use and for your glory. It reminds me of 2 Samuel 24, 24. When David bought a threshing floor, talking about threshing floor, to offer up a sacrifice for his sin, the man wanted to give it to him for free. And David said these magical words, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Oh, I just got to pause right here and just to ask us to search our own hearts. When you give to the Lord, whatever that is, does it cost you to give? Or are you always giving God the leftovers? Whether the leftovers of your treasure, your money, the leftovers of your time, the leftovers. David said, I'm not going to give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. He said, I'm not doing that. God has done so much for me and I'm going to give him just, uh, 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 just a little bit. No. It costs to give. It costs. And he said, I, the man said, oh, you can have it, David. You know, you King David, you can have it for free. He said, uh-uh, this is for the Lord. He said, I'm, uh-uh. I'm not going to give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. How much is it? Full price. How much is it? And I'm willing to pay that. See, it was at the threshing floor that God commissioned Gideon for service in Judges chapter 6. Jesus, in Luke 22, verse 31, used the analogy of the threshing floor with Peter when he said, Simon, Simon, Sam, uh, sa Satan wants to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith fails not, but when you return, strengthen your brothers. So the threshing floor is the place of separation. It's the place of sacrifice. So ask yourself, where am I? Am I still in the fields trying to get all I can get from God? Or have I reached a place in my walk where I'm at the threshing floor offering myself to my Boaz, Jesus Christ, ready to be used by him? So what happened when she went down to the threshing floor? Oh, we got to pick this up. Look at this in verses 7 through 13 so we can get the context. It says, after, and after Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? So she said, I'm Ruth. I'm your girl. Holler at your girl. I'm sorry. She said, I am Ruth, <laughs> your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. 
Then he said, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning in that you did not go after young men. Oh, she wanted to. You remember last week? That's another story. He, Boaz didn't know that, though. See, Boaz said, I can say by the young men. No, he told you the young women. And you, oh, that, well, that's another story. And he said, you did not go after the young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Underline that. Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night and in the morning it shall be that if you will perform the duty of a close, uh, close relative for you, good. Uh, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives, lie down until morning. Now, in these verses, we see that Ruth did everything that Naomi told her to do. She secretly waited until Boaz had finished eating and drinking, and she came softly and uncovered his feet. Oh, boy, I tell you. The feet is a place of worship. It, it reminds me of Mary in John chapter 12 and verse three. She took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, which was her dowry, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. Oh, I'm going to ask us again, how much time do we spend at the feet of Jesus in worship? Worship is costly. It costs Mary her life savings. What does worship cost you? When we worship him, we take on the fragrance of Christ. Like I said earlier, oh, I, I, I say this because the fragrance that was on the feet of Jesus, Mary wiped his feet with her hair, so her hair took on the fragrance that was on Christ. Finally, worship changes our homes if we allow it to. In other words, not only was the fragrance on the feet of Jesus and on the hair of Mary, but it filled the home as well. So let worship fill your home, and I guarantee you that it will change the way your home smells. Oh, I just have to ask you just to search your heart with this. What type of music do you have playing in your home and in your car? If we were to go out there now, oh, no, no, Pastor, give me a couple minutes. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> because if you would have worship, music playing in your home and in your car, it will change your home. It's hard to be yelling and screaming and at each other when worship music is going on. That's just hard to do that. Turn that off! And then so you can go at it. No, see, because you can't go at it with that going on. And on top of that, with worship music in the car, it will change your attitude on the road. Lord, I lift your name on high. Get out of the way! Yeah, you, you, it's hard. It's hard to do that. Can't believe you. Where you drive? Man, where you get your license from? Man, it, it's hard. If, if, we, if we're worshiping in the car, it, it's hard to do that, you know, that kind of thing. So worship, uh, it, it, it's worship is, is what we do, even when we're going through. It's what we do. And, and worship would change us because we're, we're worshiping at his feet. So uh, around midnight, he had his cold feet out. You know, there's nothing like when your feet is out, out of the blanket, and you know, you, you warm, you all toasted in there, and all of a sudden, whoop, your feet just slip out. And you're like, oh, it's nothing like your feet being cold. You know, in the wintertime, feet cold. And well, his feet got cold, and it woke him up in verse 8. And he sees this woman. Notice, I want you to notice. You see, he sees this woman at his feet. 
not by his side, next to him, like in some sexual position or something. No, she was at his feet, at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she said, Ruth. Then she let him know her intentions were pure, biblical, and right. She wanted him to be her goel, her redeemer, her spiritual covering. Oh, dear ladies, dear ladies, this is what you want as well, a man to be your spiritual covering. It is always sad when a single person brings their friend to meet me at church. And afterwards, I inquire about his or her spirituality. And then they're stumbling and bumbling and fumbling over words. Oh, dear lady. See, you know, I'm not, I, I wasn't smitten by Cupid's arrow. So I can see right through, especially the guys. I can see right through them. I can see through the girls too. But I can see right through the guys. And that's why it causes me to inquire about where they are with the Lord. And, and, and to see some of you fumbling, bumbling, stumbling along. And then I, I, I tilt my head and I just say, oh. They're not walking with the Lord, are they? Oh, but he, he promised that he, he would come to church and see, Pastor Tony, what had happened. I, we met. My friend introduced us. And I'm just like, oh, you about to go through an emotional roller coaster. And, and I'm saying to myself, we'll be here to pick up the pieces. Because you already know, if they haven't already, they're going to have sex with them. And then there you go. When you have sex with them, you immediately get put on the, on the roller coaster like at Bush Gardens, and you go for some loops. Then when he says deuces because he got what he wants, the heart is broken, and we're right here to pick them up, pick up the pieces. It's just what it is. This woman here, Ruth, I had to, I had to let you know what the Hebrew was saying. It was, it was implying some sexual overtones. However, when Ruth did it, Ruth was doing something that was very biblical, very pure and very right. She wanted him to be her spiritual covering. That was the way things were done back then, you know. It wasn't like, you know, hey, call, call me. It wasn't cell phones and stuff back. So this was the way, and it sounds strange to us, but in the Hebrew culture, this was not strange. As a matter of fact, this was biblical. So <clears throat> now, to let you know that she wasn't some, some floozy, some loose woman, I want you to notice this was the testimony of Boaz. Boaz says plainly in verse 10, when he called her blessed of the Lord, and in verse 11, when he called her a virtuous woman. Ruth was a Proverbs 31 woman, and Boaz was a righteous man. And notice, 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 and he didn't try to take advantage of this godly young lady. He didn't do that. Didn't do it at all. And on top of that, see, some people tried to imply read something just before service. I was just like, dude, are you serious uh, concerning these verses? Uh, he, he spent it in such a perverted way. I just said, dude, I can't, believe he, I can't believe he did that. This woman was a Proverbs 31 woman. This, this woman was, Ruth was. She was Proverbs 31. She was a virtuous woman. Boaz said it, meaning that she didn't try to take advantage of him in a inebriated or in a drunken stupor. 
I don't know how much he drank, but it was, a, it was enough to where his feet was out for a long time and then midnight occurred. Then all of a sudden he knows his feet is out. You put my feet out of the cover, I'm noticing right then, my feet are out. But she was a very righteous, he didn't try to take advantage of her. And she did, and vice versa, vice versa. She didn't try to take advantage of him. She just un uncovered him, uncovered his feet, and she just laid right there at the bottom. And here's the thing, he told her to stay until morning. Now, some people try to imply some weirdness there. No, no, no. This man is not going to send this young lady out in the middle of the night, out to go try to make her way back home. This dude was right on. He said, no, 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 stay right here. I'm going to protect you. Stay right here. And then we're going to see before all the other folks wake up and see what in the world is going on. He said, okay, you can get on to the house. It's light. It's light now. Okay. All right. The light is light enough. You can make your way on back home. This man was right on. They didn't try to take advantage uh, 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 of each other. See, because a guy who sees a woman that is virtuous, see, this is why the, the wolves used to come out a long time ago. It's, it's totally different today. Used to, long time ago, used to want to come after the church girls because they were, they were trying to live right. They were trying to be virtuous women, and th these wolves out there would try to take advantage of a woman who's pure and innocent and naive, it has a naivete about them, and they don't really know the streets and the, the you know, because they've been sheltered in the home, and, and, and they, that's an easy prey. Boaz wasn't, that wasn't Boaz. Mm -mm. And it wasn't Ruth either. They didn't try, they were godly people. So he tells her that he is a close relative, but there's one closer in verse 12. So he instructs her in verse 13 to stay the night, and he will look into the matter in the morning. And he says, if this closer relative can perform this duty, fine. But if he will not, then I got you. I've been wanting you anyway. <laughs> That's why I told you to stay in my field. Don't go anywhere else. I've been having my eye on you. So we'll see what happens next time as we finish up the, this particular chapter. Now, let me conclude with this. We, we saw God as our provider. In this chapter, we saw how God provided for Ruth and Naomi's physical needs in a major way. God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or even think. Because every time uh, Ruth made her way home, she had enough barley, enough, it, according to the Hebrew, it implies that it was so much uh, barley that she carried home that it was really a two-man carry that one person will crush under the weight of it. So God can just provide abundantly for us in a major way. This shows us that God can be our Jehovah Jireh too, provide for those things we worry about. And this is what Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. We also saw how uncovering the feet of Jesus through worship can be a beautiful thing. So spend time in worship. Spend time in prayer this week to God and allow his aroma to be on you and feel your home as well. You know, I remember when, when, I, used to, uh, when I was in the Marine Corps and I, was, I had an hour drive to uh, the part of Camp Pendleton that I was on. I would spend time listening to Bible studies, and then I would get there early enough, late people, early enough to where I would spend time in prayer. I would spend time just praying to God or, you know, reading additionally, because I read before I left the house. And I would, I would spend that time with the Lord because it's no telling what I'm going to face when I'm dealing with Marine Corps stuff. And then once I got out of the Marine Corps, then I had a job that was about 15, 20 minutes further up the road than the part of Camp Pendleton I was on. So I had like about an hour 15, hour 20 minute drive. Spent time listening to Bible studies, worshiping, praying. I got there early enough. I was always half an hour, 45 minutes earlier than I was supposed to be there. <laughs> Some of y'all gonna be late for your funeral. I'm gonna tell you that. But, but it's, it's so I can have the aroma of prayer 
uh, when I went into, and, and then when I went out to do my cable jobs, I had to meet customers and stuff and, and was one of the best in the company. One of the best in the company. Got tips and stuff all the time, all the time. Phone in, compliments and all, all kind of stuff. So God bless, God bless that time of, of just giving that time first to him Spending time in worship and prayer to him. And then when I greeted those customers, oh, hey, how you doing? Ring, ring, ring. This is uh, Dimension Cable. Well, you know, I had your installer here. He was so nice. He was a nice guy. I just really like, had that constantly, two, three, four, a week, a week. And it was all because of God. Spending that time in worship and prayer. And then I would go on either uh, Camp Pendleton as a Marine or as a cable installer and technician, I would go with the aroma of Christ. I needed that. Some of those customers was a trip. <laughs> Ooh, I needed that aroma bad. So finally, ladies, seek to imitate Ruth and men, let us seek to imitate Boaz. Both of them passed the test when they were placed in a dangerous spot, they both passed the test. Yes, she could have flipped that blanket right off of Boaz, <laughs> but she didn't. She just uncovered his little puppies, his little feet. That's all she did. And then once he saw who was down there, this woman he had his eye on, it's, mid, it's after midnight. Everybody sleep. All right, come on up here, girl. He could have easily have done that. But he didn't take advantage of her. You know, they were, she was a virtuous woman, and he was a stand-up guy. May we be a stand-up guy, men. And ladies, may you seek to be like Ruth, a virtuous woman. Father, thank you so much for this time you've given us to study your word. We pray, God, that this word will sink into our hearts. We pray, dear God, that it will bear fruit, that we won't leave here being just hear hearers of your word, but may we be doers as well. Help us, Lord, to spend time in worship and prayer. Help us to have the aroma of Christ. Help us, Lord, to change the atmosphere of our homes and and Lord, the atmosphere in our cars, oh God, I just pray that you would change us. Lord, let us not just be out in the fields where we're just seeking to get from you. Let us come to the threshing floor where we're ready to offer ourselves a sacrifice for you, Lord. That we'll offer ourselves for your use. Offer ourselves to you to use us as you see fit. Lord, let us get to the place where we are out of the fields and we're at the threshing floor. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.